Every single boxer, every time you get through those ropes, no matter whether it's sparring or competing, you change as a person. It's that danger if you're getting in there and you're taking damage, you're losing brain cells and you can get seriously hurt, especially in a sport like boxing. You have to have respect for any fighter steps through the ropes, whether it's sparring, whether it's a fight, because they put their lives in the lane every time. If you walked away from the sport right now at 31 years of age, financially, are you good? I always was smart with my money and done the right things and the right investments throughout my career. This and everybody's in this game for money. The people that say, like, no, I'm in it for legacy and all this politics, that's a load of shit, man. They're in it for money. You're only in it for money. What is too hard of a game to be into, to be uh, just in it to, you know, have the crack. You know, you're, you're as I say, you're putting life on the line every time you step in the ring, no matter who you face. Ireland's finest fighter. Who am I talking about? Mick Comden. I invite him to Woodbury House in Mayfair for a part two. He's fought for world titles, he set up new businesses, and he's got new plans. Be happy, never content, and make sure you're subscribing to this episode. Before we start this week's podcast, I have to give a special mention to our sponsors. I Secure Vehicles. They are a brilliant company, a family-run business, and they specialize in vehicle safety and security throughout the UK. I know this company very well, and I also know the people behind the brand. If you've been following me on my podcast journey and on social media, you will know that I love cars and so does my network. This is why I'm very, very excited to be working with iSecure Vehicles, and this is why we have chosen them to be our sponsors for the Stephen Sully Study Podcast. Their team are professionals, experts, and they're efficient. Once their product is installed on your car, your vehicles, you will have the peace of mind that your asset is protected. Trust me, do not wait until it's too late. Get protection now. For more information about their products, including dash cameras, undetected immobilizers, and also car tracking systems, head over to isecure dash vehicles.co.uk and remember to mention the Stephen Sully study podcast sent you right welcome back to the podcast Stephen Sully study I've been chasing this man for a part two for some time Mr Mick Condon thank you very much for agreeing this part two no problem, welcome Steve. on board and I'm looking forward to this conversation before we begin what do you think of the new podcast set up and also the new gallery in Mayfair yeah I'm, I'm loving it I'm, I'm wondering how can I stay one of the paintings and get out of here? Um, <laughs> no, but it's fantastic. A great setup. Um, lovely place. Um, much bigger, much more spacious, and obviously some fine art around the place. Yeah. So part of the reason why I called on the the, the part two with you, uh, Mick, is um, I feel the podcast has developed, and quite naturally, you as a guest and also a pro athlete boxer have definitely progressed in your in your career. There's been some highs. And there's also been, let's say, some challenges and some, some, some lows. Before we begin, I listened to one of your podcasts earlier, mm. and um, there were some, some things in there that you said that I, 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 I'd never picked up before. Belfast. Mm. Why is Belfast the best city in the world? It's the safest place in the world for me. Um, it's where I grew up, and you know, it's where I feel most safe. Um, I know everybody, I know everything, and it just... A very welcoming city and somewhere which you know I was born so has always been top of my list um, you gave me a slight version of, of, of the same answer when I first interviewed you and then I listened to this podcast and you really went into depth about Belfast and I really want to go over there so as and when yeah. I'm ready with the family I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you up you mate. should definitely 100% you're more than welcome do you know what's really scary? The first podcast that we did is in 2021 in November, which oh, really? time time has flown. Jeez. So let's talk about your life and also career since then. Um, quite naturally, there's been the two uh, world title fights. Yep. Um, last night, I sat there watching again for probably the third or fourth time, the Woods versus yourself fight. Yeah. And I've got to tell you that I thought in the, in the second, third, fourth round, after you knocked him down in the first round, yeah. I honestly felt that he was moments away from going. And yeah. every single commentator yeah, yeah. said the same. Testament to the fact that he's got a hard, he's, he's a tough guy, yeah. tough chin, and he kept on pursuing and then eventually obviously turned around the fight. 
How did you feel going into that fight and during the fight, even when you were halfway through, you know, six, seven round mm. through, how did you think it was going to end? I didn't think it was going to end how it ended. Um, I was very confident going in and throughout the fight. I was very confident then, obviously, the ending was unexpected. Um, fatigue kicked in and uh, you know, I, was, I was caught a shot, which I didn't see because I made a, a solid defensive move and you know, paid the price. And, I suppose that's just boxing. Um, you win or you learn kind of thing, isn't it? So uh, it was devastating. Losing for me is probably one of the most hardest things I can go through. I hate losing. And now my two world title fights have both lost. to be both very, very hard to swallow. Hmm. Um, something that uh, a few people will notice if you watch it back a few times is when you did fall out the ring yeah. your brother was there to catch you and the thing I'm going to mention is his face because mm. he's not just someone in your corner who's there as a business person he's, yeah. he's your family he's your friend he's your mentor he's someone that you looked up to as you being the younger brother and you could see kind of the, the terror fear the anxiety the, mm. the stress on his face it must be hard for family members to watch you box yeah, I think, you know, my missus, until until the last fight, or the, the, the wood fight, she was never really bothered by the fights because, you know, I was, everything was at a counter, really. I was just flowing and winning comfortably and never really in any trouble. And then the wood fight went and ended how it ended. And after that, she finds it hard to watch any fight now. Mm. because she just didn't like to see it. My brother, you no, know, it's obviously very hard for him to watch me because, and I, I know how hard it would be because I felt the same watching him. He was always in wars when he fought. Um, and I'm not always in wars, but the two losses I've been have been kind of wars. And um, yeah, it's very hard, very tough. Do you, do you, I don't know if you remember that, that punch that obviously ended it, but mm. it almost, it, from an outsider, from you know, just someone looking mm. on TV or YouTube, yep. it looked like didn't look like the hardest punch. It just yeah. looked like really, really and clean. It, it probably wasn't. It wasn't even that it caught me clean either. I think, you know, maybe it, fatigue. Did, it did catch me clean, but it was more fatigue. Mm. If you look at the the work and uh, and the output, that's one of the things I learned from it. You know, the output which I had been putting out, I'd been doing way too much where I didn't need to. I, even and if you watched Eleven Thrown. And I'm still adamant to this day, the knockdown, which was counted, was a slip. It was. And that, but that's, that whole thing changed the momentum of the fight because if you look, Lee in the 11th round is also done. But when I slipped and I went down, he obviously got that second win. He's like, I've got him. And he did at the, in the end. But um, that just changed the momentum of everything. Yeah. And if you watch the 11th round, up until that point, I'm punching holds in, in, in Lee. I'm giving them you know, a serious look heading, throwing so much punches um, and just wasting energy because if I had just been smart and, and boxed instead of just trying to take them out, I probably would be here as world champion today. Yeah. And, and do you know when like something like that happens and, uh, you know, I, 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 I sort of described it as the same thing, which is, it was like fatigue. It wasn't. Mm. It wasn't like it actually hurt you, yeah. or it was a really hard or or, yeah. or or massively clean shot. It just looked like the lights went out because just super tired because yeah. you're given that that fight your all. But to actually be on the other end of that and the lights go off, does it does it hurt you? Just wake up and you're somewhere else. Like what happens? Nah, you just wake up and you're concussed. Obviously, you get concussion after after being knocked out. That's natural when you get knocked out, but you don't you don't feel it you just I, I woke up and I remember I was I was laying I'd woke up but obviously was still a bit like you no, know, in la la land probably when I was awake at the ring I was awake at the ring but probably came around in my senses and stuff my senses stuff came back to uh, around when I was just about to go into the ambulance or when I was on my way to the ambulance and my bro one of my brothers would save me and I says what happened and H was there as well and he says what happened and he says you lost I me mean, what round <laughs> he says uh the last round i says how long is left <laughs> and he says 
a minute and a half. And I just went, oh, I closed my eyes and put my head back. I remember that. Like, I was just, I was, just didn't want to think it, didn't want to see it. And it, it was what it was. But, you know, um, again, like every loss, you know, like every win, someone has to win, someone has to lose. And you just got to take it on the chin and try to move forward. You made a very profound statement in one of your other in interviews, and I, and I resonate with it a lot, which is every single boxer, every time you get through those ropes, mm. no matter whether it's sparring or competing, you change as a person. Mm. What do you mean by that? How I look at it is that, you know, we have millions or billions of trillions of brain cells and all that there, but you know, every time you get hit on the head, whether you're hitting the ball or whether you're getting punched, you lose some of those brain cells. So if you don't have the brain cells you had before that, you literally are a different person, aren't you? So it's that danger if you're getting in there and, and, and you're taking, if you're taking damage, you're losing brain cells and you can get seriously hurt, especially in a sport like boxing. Um, so you have to have respect for any fitter steps through the ropes, whether it's sparring, whether it's a fight, because they put their lives in the lane every time. Hmm. So going back to the first round and you knock him down right at the end, yeah. very, very clean punch. And I don't know if you, you've probably watched it a few times, his right leg mm. literally folds back. It, mm. it, it reminded me a bit like when George Groves got knocked out by Froch in, in, in the second fight. Yeah. You know when someone's kind of knocked out or really damaged because mm. that leg is, a, is just not even there to support them. That yeah. It just goes and it just disappears. And I was quite surprised he got back up. Um, when you hit him with that shot, was you surprised he got back up and carried on? Yeah, listen, I was surprised he got up 100%. Um, so, you know, what if, if there was another 30 seconds in that round, it would be over? You know, how did he, how did he get up? He just had great resilience and, and very... Uh, very tough and like he can he can endure a lot of uh, damage and you know it was it was a great shot I didn't expect that was one thing which I wasn't expecting to go in there and, and flatten Lee like that in the first round and and that's another thing where I'm going the energies have used so much energy because I don't fight like that I don't fight like so much aggressive I'm a boxer always and I went in and threw a bomb landed it I didn't even try to throw hard I just threw it fast and it landed right on the chin even down like a ton of bricks um, he got up and you know he had the minute obviously really helped him but even at the rounds after that he was gone so much times but just would have done something to, to survive and that's that's a, a credit to him yeah I, I was surprised as well because I think it was Darren Barker was commentating mm. and if I remember rightly in your southpaw stance you've kind of touched him to the body a few times saw mm. he was dropping his hand and he sort of yeah. threw over the, the, the left hand and, and that's how you caught him but he kind of didn't learn from it for like two or three rounds you no. kept on catching and kept on catching him I don't think you learned from it the whole fight I think it was just you know obviously when you're throwing so much punches the punches don't have the same effects and obviously I was just trying to get him out of there instead of just trying to tame that one shot again mm. um and, and just waiting for it and letting it come. I was just trying to blitz him to try and get out. But um, again, I credit to him and his, his toughness. And yeah, he's, he's definitely, definitely super tough. Straight after that fight, you said you would like to run it back and, and, and do it yep. again. Um, I know you've had three fights since and you've, yep. you've obviously got a few things in the pipeline and, and changes going on in, in, in your life and also your camp. Would you like to get that Lee Wood, Mick Conlon fight on for part two? 100%. Um, you know, whether he wins or whether he loses against Josh Warrington, you know, I, I would still fight him no matter what. And it's a great one. You know, I've seen him saying we could do it in the city ground and stuff and I'd have no problem going to that end again. No problem at all. I'd go there and, and uh, I'd happily fight him in the city ground. And it'd be a fantastic fight to have again. It was a, it was a fight of the year all around the world. Um, so I don't think anybody would begrudge that fight happening. But it's a, it's in his hands, really, isn't it? Um, unless he, he he unless he loses against Warrington, um, it's going to be in his hands of whether he wants to take the fight or not. Yeah. I've got to get back into the position for things to be happening for me, and and that's the thing now. I just got to build my way back. Yeah. 
So since then, you had two other fights mm. that you won, yeah. uh, and they were relatively were pretty tough fights as yeah. well. They weren't no mugs. No. And then you stepped up in Belfast to fight Lopez um, yeah. in your in your hometown. And again, I started watching that fight uh, last night for I think that was the second time I watched it, and just the first couple of rounds, like you were just so slick. And the thing, the thing is, everyone was saying to because I didn't really know much about Lopez, but everyone kept on saying this guy's not a, this guy's not a boxer; he's just just a fighter. Yeah. And you could really see from his style, he had doesn't really have much flair and much nah, kind it's of just like unorthodox. Crazy. It just cu- just comes yeah. in like like that. And so, uh, he, he, there was a couple of times he was jumping off the floor, like, yeah. like hit him. How tough is Lopez? Yeah, he was he was very tough and he and he was good. You know, I, I knew it was hurting him. He was making noises when it was hitting him to the body and stuff. But um, on that night, you know, I'm not here to make excuses, but I just didn't perform. Simple as that. Um, I went and had a, a war with someone who that's their game. You know what I mean? And that wasn't what I should have been doing. It wasn't what I had planned to do. Um, so you you know you you pay the price when you don't follow your own plan. Yeah. So I'm um, obviously good friends with uh, Ben Davis down Boxing Booth and a load of guys yeah. down there, James Bonney. And I know a lo- load of them went over to, to support you. And they say every time they go over there to Belfast, mm. it's just amazing. Yeah. They say they get treated like celebrities because <laughs> you are a celebrity yeah. over there. Yeah. And they said it's just such a nice feeling to go and see you. But it's also very de- devastating as well at the same time yeah. when the main man that they, they're, they're following and supporting d- doesn't get the win and yeah. also does unfortunately get get got stopped in the fifth round yeah. there was obviously when I'm down there I'll go down there most Fridays to do the sparring and sometimes on, on a Sunday and obviously I'm chatting to the guys going like what happened and everything else yeah. and did some people are saying oh maybe he's going to retire maybe he's not and at 31 years of age mm. you're not old no. but you're definitely not young no. um, if you was a heavyweight yeah. you could be fighting until you're 40 45 yeah, years yeah, of age yeah. no problem because that's what people do but people who are kind of featherweight or lightweight bantamweight those yeah. kind of divisions you don't really see them really going past like 33 34 35 no, no. so after the lopez fight was there a consideration of retiring 100 percent, 100 percent. there was i was just thinking can i go through all this again having to kind of rebuild and do all that stuff again and, and go through everything which I went through. Um, no, I'm away. I, I'm based here in in the UK most of the time when I'm in training camps. Um, that'll change now, but for the last five years I've been over here, and if I fight four times a year, you know that's four, you know four times eight or nine weight camps. Then three times a year it's th- there'll be three twelves. Um, and this one, just that first one, I'd probably overtrain because they're on 16 weeks. I was 16 weeks away from my family. It's an awful lot of time away from your family. And I was going, do I really have that amazing to be away from my family for another load of years? And it was a serious consideration to go, fuck this. Because it's tough. Boxing is a tough game. Training is very, very tough. And how I train is very, very tough because I push myself to limits every time. I don't miss sessions. I I don't cheat in anything. I just go as hard as I can. Um, so yeah, it was it was a consideration to go to have it and me do it again and had to sit down with my family and, and talk about this and go through things and you know ask them do you still believe I it can be, become world champion? Ask my brother who's my manager who has my best interests at heart. And if he had told me no, I would have said okay, I'm done then. So the fact. That he still believed in me I could be world champion I was okay um, I can do that and asked a few other people who who are close to me just still believe that and they said yes Um, they didn't think that was me in there on on the night and you know they don't see why I would you know pack it in but they understand if I really wanted to they would understand so I took a bit of time spoke to my wife spoke to my kids and out of all my kid my daughter she was the one she was the most going no you're never retiring you're not retiring you might you're my dad you're you're you can't be you can't stop being a boxer and stuff so that's why i just says no nah, I'll, I'll i'll give it a go again you know if it, with all that kind of took into consideration i'll go again well uh, i'm guessing the best soundboard 
for this situation out of all those people that you just mentioned mm. is your brother Jamie not only because he is your brother not only because he is your your manager yeah. but the, the most important thing for me is mm. he was a former professional boxer who yeah. fought at a very very high level yeah. and if anyone's going to understand it he yeah. is so to get his kind of approval must have made you feel pretty good to keep on going definitely I uh, you know he, if I had told him no, I, I don't care if, if you believe that I, I'm done, he wouldn't have no problem with it. But he said he still believed in me, he still believed they could it could be that world champion, which we have all believed and I've, I've always believed. So, and um, once he said that, I was like, okay, now nah, I'll, I'll run it again, I'll re I'll throw the dice again, and let's see where we land. Yeah, C can I ask a bit of a weird question? Might be a bit of an intrusive question, but. If you walked away from the sport right now at 31 years of age, financially, are you are you are you good? Yeah. You could just yeah. walk away now. I could walk away now and I doesn't mean I can just walk away and sit on my hands, you know, I'd have to get in this up. But we're doing the promoting now with Conlon Boxing. Um obviously I have a lot of property and stuff and uh, I've been smart with my money over the years, I haven't been silly. Um it was one thing which always worried me you know when you see old faders and they're all bankrupt and you know broke and you know living on the streets and the rest like i never want to be like that so i always was smart with my money and, and and done the right things and the right investments throughout my career so if you did hang it up today mm -hmm. your your natural default position would probably go straight into being a promoter mm -hmm. and trainer no, I'd never train someone. No, no, nah, it's not for me. You don't, you don't, you don't I fancy I think I could probably be a good trainer if I really wanted to it, but I don't, I don't, it's a lot of time, a lot of effort and a lot of commitment and it's just something that I don't think, you know, if I'm in something, I'm in it 100% and it's something I probably wouldn't want to be in 100% because it's a very unforgiving um, role in boxing mm. and sorry to label on these two points again but just I wanted to see like the psychology from mm. the family's point of view you know you've had two relatively bad sort of mm. knockouts yeah and then the conversation about retirement's come up yeah your wife like didn't she say look you, you've been hurt a couple of times here yeah, we're, we're yeah. good nah she was she was like no nah, I still believe you can do what you gotta do I know that wasn't you in there um and you know, if I look at the Lopez one, a lot of people think that you just had like a bad knockout and stuff. But uh, if you look if you, and you watch it, I actually get up to tell this coming. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like it was a bad knockout. Now the wood one, I get it. You know what I mean? I get when people say it because when they do the ring and stuff. So obviously it looks it looks really bad. But with Lopez, you know, I I, I probably would have beat the count, but I probably would have got hurt even more. So it was the right thing, I believe, throwing the talon. Um, so yeah. Um, they that's where that's where my brother and stuff was saying like if he did finish you know i'd have no problem i, I want to get the two views actually from that fire mm. what they felt that you maybe have done wrong or wasn't pro an element that you wasn't progressing in hence why maybe you got the result or lost that particular fight the view from your brother first of all jamie yeah conlon and then also from the view from Adam Booth, because he yeah. he's, he was your he is your co coach currently. Yeah. So, Jamie, what did he think that you done wrong in that fight? I implemented the wrong game plan. I went to go to war instead of just boxing, instead of using everything I'd kind of planned to, um, you know, plan to the kind of move, make a miss, take it later before I even considered standing toe to toe. Um, and just obviously follow the wrong game plan. So that was his his thing looking on it says, why did you do it? And this is, I don't know why, I just felt off. And I did, I just felt off before. So I remember even in the changing room, was, Fuck, something didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to say that when you're in the changing room, ready to walk away for a world health fit. Yeah. And uh, Adam Booth, what did he say on, on reflection? Yeah, he, he just thought, you know, I, I didn't show up. I wasn't, it wasn't me. Um, it wasn't the performance that I'd set out to do. Um, so yeah, same kind of thing. Yeah, um, you've had you've made some statements um, in 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 I think even on social media and with the Belfast. I think it was Times Belfast Times. I think yeah, you I think it. so. Yeah, um, 
And you've actually said that you need a complete change up, switch up. Yeah. Um, so my first question is this, is your time up with top rank? Um, not officially. We're in a period of negotiation where they want to keep me and it's a possibility. I still may, still may be a top rank, but um, I'm out of contract as it is. They want to have negotiations about resaying and doing more fights and stuff, but I want to look at every option. Um, I don't want to jump into um, another contract with a promoter from the start. Right now, if the offer isn't right, I wouldn't I wouldn't take it. So if the offer was right, yeah, I probably would, but um, I may want to look around to see what their options are on the table. Well, when you say, because I'm intrigued as well, because I'm an outsider, mm. right? And we hear this all the time from top level fighters, if yeah. the contract's right. Does that basically mean if the money's right? Money and fate plan. Okay. Money and fate plan. What ways, what, what's the route back to world title? Okay. How do you see us getting back there? What does the money look like? And, and yeah, so of course, money is a, is a vital part in this game. Um, you're never going to fight for free, are you? Yeah. And you're putting your life on every time when you step in the ring. It's not a chance to fight for free. You want to get the most out of every single fight you can. So you're, th- you're 31. Mm. Have you said to yourself, like an age, that you feel that you're going to retire? I always say 32, 33. But I'm 32 in November. So I'm not going to go 32. Um, and if I don't achieve my goals by 33, who knows? Might just go fuck this and, and pack it in then. But, you know, we've got... I've got him just over a year like now the the combo world champion and you know I think I probably wouldn't go past 34 I wouldn't go past 34 yeah but who fucking knows no, who knows <laughs> if everything's going well and I'm not taking no damage who knows and you're getting 10 mil fight yeah exactly knows? that you know what I mean yeah exactly that so we'll see guys I wanted to hop on here to once again thank the sponsors of this week's podcast I Secure Vehicles When we were searching around for sponsors for the channel, we honestly wanted to get a brand, a company that will give massive amount of value to our audience. And that is definitely iSecure Vehicles. They have a wide range of products which are designed to keep your vehicle, your asset safe and secure. Some of those products are dash cameras, undetected immobilizers, and car tracking systems. Head over to iSecure to look at their products and make sure you say that the Stephen Sully Study podcast sent you there. Surely the likes of Frank Warren, Eddie Hearn, have been knocking on your door recently? Well, I know there's been a few conversations asking about my plans and stuff, but we're just keeping the cards close to the chest for the next way. And then and we'll start to have a look around and speak to people. Yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. Adam Booth. You said that you're um, you're no longer working with Adam Booth. Yeah. Obviously, I'm a friend of yours, and I yeah. train down the same same gym, not at the same time, but I go down there frequently. And I, obviously, I follow you on Instagram, yeah. and I saw you were training down there recently. So it kind of looks like you're there, and yeah, and you're not. What 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 is the situation with you and Adam well, Booth and uh, Boxing Booth? We have uh, well, Adam Booth and Boxing Booth gym are, are, are separate entities, really, aren't they? Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm still I'm over getting a little bit of fitness before I'm going to head over to Miami and have a look at a few coaches over there. Um, but yeah, me and Adam have parted ways. Um, I went and seen him and told him I just wanted something different, want, wanted something new, something fresh. And, you know, I, I think I'm going to go to stateside to have a look. And no, it was no problem. There was a handshake and all the end. And it was it was done on good terms, I think. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the plan. Because I know you've been with him since 2018 yeah um initially why did you come over from belfort no because you was obviously was over in, in, LA. Amer- in, in la in but LA, yeah. why why um why go to adam booth in the first place and why come over to the to to, to the uk he always intrigued me as a coach and and you know if there was a coach in the uk at that time who i was going to train with it was adam i was i was the one i wanted to train with so i went and done like a trial with him and uh like what I what what I was doing, like what I seen, and thought it was going to be best for me at that time, and and it was, and and we had a great ride. And the reason being changed, you know, we we have had two world title fights, and both have been, you know, unsuccessful. Now, 
I've only kind of speaking to my my other team and and speaking to everybody and you know I was asking what do you think about this what do you think of that and I'm thinking about leaving and they were thinking yeah listen it, it might be a good thing you know have have a change of things up so first went over that before I went over that and before I knew it was going what I was going to do because it was kind of in the immediate aftermath and I spoke to my sister do you still believe I can be world champion and he says yes I do 100 percent um I don't think that was you in there on on the fight night so um, I still believe you have all the ability in order to be world champion or wouldn't train you. Um, so that was, I was happy he said that. And then, you know, now, I, if, about a month later, I, I was even thinking, speaking to my family, speaking to, speaking to my brother and to say, listen, probably time to change things up and went over and seen him, sit down with him, no problem. Let's, let's, let's change it up. and wish you all the best and you're more than welcome to come back anytime you want so yeah, he was totally cool with yeah, you it was all, all, all cool it was all cool it was all done on on, on on good terms and you know I think as a man I had to go over and do it say it in face to face but where I'm at uh, I wasn't going to text him because a lot of people would text people but I think it's better to do it the manly way and, and, and say face to face and there's no bad feelings on my end and just let's let's move on yeah i mean face to face is just integral right mm -hmm. you know some people just do it over text yeah. or or they get their missus or mum to call them that's and the world we live in now isn't it a lot of people are just texting things and just saying it that way and instead of he facing things head on and you know i'd rather do it you know up front and, and be be a man with things you, you've always struck me to be honest the Irish always strike me you know, my, my, my mum's side's Irish and obviously I've seen a lot of the mm. traits there they're always old school everything's mm. old school you fight shake hands at the end you have a good drink you know if you've got a problem with someone you go and see them and that, I've always admired that about yeah. yourself and also also the Irish is that the way you live your life? Yeah I think with me I'm, I'm very straight and you know old school in a sense but one thing I, I find hard is I, I don't like to hate emotions. Not find hard, I just don't like to hate emotions. So if I like you, you'll know I like you. If I don't like you, probably most likely you'll know I don't like you. And you know, it's a, it's a good thing, but also a bad thing, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, I think that's just how I've been. I've been always straight. And even if you look back to the Olympics and stuff where I was calling it the corruption there and then, and, a lot of people in, in that position would have just went, oh, well, I have to go back and look at it and stuff and have their media training and stuff. I just threw it out of the window and just went, being honest, because I think that's the most important thing is honesty. Yeah. And, you know, what, what people may or may not know, know about you and something to admire is when when athletes talk about sacrifice there's mm. obviously different levels of sacrifice you know you're not going to go out with your friends on the weekend you're not going to the boozer you're not going to be eating crap you're yeah. going to be training dedication all that kind of stuff but but you have gotten this other level which is you've got a young family a son and a daughter over yeah. in belfast with your wife and you don't even get to see them for their birthdays and no. stuff I've got two sons right mm. and they've just been away with their mum in Devon for about a week yeah. and I honestly felt like I messed them for it was almost like a, like I felt like a year mm. that must really really be tough for you like not seeing them it is and especially on their special occasions and stuff but even like the small things like you know if they're going to like camp or something if they're doing something and I'm not there they feel it and and my my son probably more so than my daughter feels it my daughter is very strong very independent and Obviously, she really misses me when I leave, but and, and probably because when I come back, she's happy when I come back because she gets everything she wants. But uh, my son finds it hard, I think. Um, you know, he hates going to school and stuff when I'm not there and stuff like that. So he feels it. He misses that kind of presence of, of you know, the father figure around. And it is tough. You know, I've missed plenty of birthdays, um, you know, holidays a lot with them you know they're going away my mrs shauna she's going away by herself with the kids um it's tough very very tough and uh hard especially when you see the pictures and stuff you just wish you were with them mm, i can imagine mm. so kirk walker who's yeah. another phenomenal yeah. talent super 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 fighter and i'm going to be uh hopefully try and get him on the podcast at yeah. some point soon i know he's under your your uh, your promotional company yeah is your brother looking after him? 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, we we promote them and we manage them. Okay. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize from another podcast there was a once upon a time ago that you two might have fought as amateurs. Yeah. T- tell me about that. Me yeah, and my brother as well. We almost fought as amateurs too. Um, you and your brother. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you and Jamie. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'll tell you that one first. So it was two thousand and ten. Uh, in the Ulster Championships which got you on the selection board for the Commonwealth Games and Jamie there was three people entered Jamie got the bar to the final I fought in the semi-final against the other guy um, I beat the other guy uh, and him and Jamie were 1-1 one, one, one against each other But so when I beat him Jamie says listen I'll go pro you go to the Commonwealth Games and he he. So we're actually meant to fight each other in the final, but he ended up going pro then, and I went. Uh, I went to the Commonwealth Games. What the hell would that have been like? Like fighting it never would have happened. Never would have happened. It could never happen. My my mother would never let it happen, and and we wouldn't fight each other. Um, yeah. Probably at that time, I probably seen I would have fought him, and probably at that time he would have he, he would have battered me. So, um, yeah, it it could never have happened, but um. It's a good bit of history where it actually meant that I've got a win over him because it's a walkover. Um, so yeah, um, but that was that was me and him. But with me and Kurt, um, so Kurt was kind of ended up becoming the number two behind me when I was still as an amateur when when I qualified or I was going to qualify for the twenty sixteen Olympics. I think I qualified through WSB first, so that was in the May, and then I was on holiday in July in Portugal. And uh, I got a phone call from the head coach, Billy Walsh, and he says, hey, Mick, uh, do you want to go to the European Championships? And I says, no. He says, okay, well, we're going to send Kurt Walker. And if Kurt qualifies for the World Championships and then qualifies for the Olympics, um, you'll have to box off against Kurt. And I says, nah, fuck Kurt, I'll go. <laughs> I says, fuck him, he's not getting the chance. <laughs> because I knew he was good enough to actually probably go and do it. So um, I went anyway. I, I, Dropped, put the paint down and just started going run on the next like week of the holiday get back trained for two weeks in, in Dublin with the national squad went to the Europeans ended up winning the Europeans and then went to the World Championships and ended up winning the World Championships so he's probably one of the catalysts for me doing that there where, where do you see Kurt Walker going with his career? Yeah, Kurt could go all the way um, you know obviously if he's gated right by us and and that's our plan is to get him right and obviously improving all the time in the gym and i think throughout his five fights so far he hasn't had it easy he's been matched very tough and um you can see in his performances though he's he's performing very very well so um he's just getting better and better compared to most prospects obviously because he's olympian he was going to go a bit deeper at the start and and that's why it's been harder but um you know he's 27 now you want to get as much of the career as possible so that's why we want to keep him active yeah in an ideal world right going back to your career becoming world champion you've got that desire that goal that belief that you're going to be that world champion and that was the first thing i said to a few of the boys down the gym i was like he cannot it it was just like me venting Mm -hmm. he can't leave the sport without without becoming a world champion because i always saw you as a world champion before you are a world champion in an ideal world, you've got the the right coach. You've got someone in Miami. You know, everything's going well. What is your ideal route to world championship? Like, how do you visualize that going right now? Staying in the same weight, weight division or are you yeah, going to pivot? Yeah, I'll stay. Like, people I've seen after that last year saying he needs to move up weight and stuff. But I don't. I, I make featherweight quite comfortably, you know. So um, I don't need to move up weight. Um, I think I just got to keep doing what I'm doing, keep trying to improve. Um, and obviously going to Miami will help with that with, with sparring and stuff and, and, and the sparring partners available, which will be much more in, in the US than there is in the UK. So that'll help. Um, but also just, now I probably have that chip on my shoulder that I've been there twice and I haven't got it. And the third time lucky is what I'm saying. You know, I think I'll have two to three fights from probably the end of the year starting maybe two and then three next year maybe you know maybe go St. Patrick's Day and then Belfast or New York uh, and then we go again in August and then December hopefully a World Health Day yeah um, okay so 
the thing you just touched on there as well which I, I, didn't, I didn't ask you last time which I'm quite intrigued about is the culture of being a pro working your way up challenging for a world title you need the best of the best of the best around you from yeah. physio to your nutritionist to the coach etc yeah. but you need world world level sparring yeah okay so you when you were your last fight you know you were at boxing booth you are yeah. in Surrey how do you go about getting the right sparring partners because you can't always have the same sparring partners yeah. every single camp how, how do you decide to go about bringing people in yeah well I got I got to fly a lot of people in um, how do you decide that like do you say oh that guy over there Jimmy 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 looks around he skirts around for me thinks asks around as well who do you think would be best the master styles and, and you know replicate styles and that one because of how unorthodox Lopez was we had a, a few Italians in because the Italian kind of fighters are very unorthodox at times so um, we had a few Italians over and um, a few local kids as well so yeah it was a bit a little bit different but like I'd be bringing kids in usually from Mexico and all around the South America and stuff so yeah and our sparring partners they're just there to spar or these people real fighters no they're real fighters they're real fighters like one of the Thailand kids won the European, I think, one of the European titles there recently. Um, so yeah, uh, they're, they're actual fighters who are, who are training for fights as well. They're in preparation, so they're happy to come and get the work because they need it for their own fights. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's always, always, it's not just guys who, who go to spar, it's actual fighters coming over, up and coming kids and even veterans and stuff we get. Yeah. And typically, mm. A sparring partner, how much will they get paid? Well, if you're flying someone in, especially from like South America, you got to pay for flights first. Which is going to be 1500 quid. Yeah, else. most likely. Um, and then you go, okay, well, they've got the flights. You can now need to put them up for however long, if it's two, three, four weeks, whatever it is, got to put them up in an apartment or a hotel or something. Um, so that costs a pretty penny. And then you gotta give them um, you know, probably eighty quid a day, um, probably fifty quid a day. I don't know um, to eat and and have food and stuff. And then you gotta pay them for the spawn, which is gonna be, you know, if you're doing ten round spawn or twelve round spawn, probably getting five hundred, maybe more than five hundred. I don't even know. I let Jamie just sort it all all the payments. I just make the payments. He. He just tells me what their penis is okay sound but uh yeah it's some people get like the kids in the uk probably getting 50 quid around and then so on and so on you know what I mean? people have obviously seen your, your great fights on tv because it's there for the public to see but i'm pretty sure there's been some amazing fights in the gym yeah. sparring yeah. can you name anyone or a any occasion where you thought jesus that person was very very tough no, I, not no one in particular. But you know, I've had plenty of tough spars. You know, when even when I when I lived in LA, it was like every 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 week you were having tough spars, and the caliber of sparring partners there was crazy. I had the like Zabs in the gym of Oscar Valdez, who was world champion. Jesse McLeano, who was a world champion, and and then like kids were just coming in from everywhere. Like, now I didn't spar, but Bevel and stuff was coming to the gym to get sparring. So. Um, it was Southern California is probably like a hotbed for professional boxing. You know, everybody from all over the world, you know, Russians, Ukrainians, Kazakhs, Uzbeks, and then you've got all the Mexicans, you got the Venezuelans, Colombians, everybody who is there. So um, a lot of people come there to get that work. Yeah. Just want your, your sort of opinion on the, the, the state of boxing right now, because mm -hmm. I feel like it's definitely morphed and changed since yeah. we've done our first uh, podcast. Yeah. Some people say for the better, some people say for the worse, but it definitely has changed. Yeah. I think noticeably is this crossover boxing or YouTube yeah. boxing. Um, <laughs> there's no done nine, it's there's, there's quite entertaining at some yeah. points, but then on the other side, is has it damaged slightly the, the reputation of boxing um, what's your view on like the whole yeah. YouTube boxing Jake Jake Paul Logan Paul I, fighting I, I don't I don't really have a view on it um, because I've watched it you know I've watched it I've been I've been enthralled by the build ups and I think he's done a fantastic job promoting and, and, and pushing things but the only thing that gets me is you go 
they're not real boxers. I know Jake Paul has pro license and stuff, but I'm going, these guys aren't real fighters and, and they're pretending like they're real fighters and it kind of discredits the kids who who will never probably achieve you no know, t- titles or, or earn a lot of money in boxing, but have given their lives to it and have been so dedicated and committed throughout their whole lives and, and they don't they'll never achieve no point not 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 one percent of what they earn. And that's terrible, I think, you know. It's it's doing nothing for kind of the grassroots and the money coming into normal boxing. It's all and there's loads of money in the celebrity boxing and the YouTuber boxing, whatever you want to call it. But uh I don't begrudge them because I don't begrudge any man making money. It's, you know, the fair play to you kind of thing. Um but yeah I don't think that's it's not really something I, I think about in terms of the state of boxing. What the state of boxing for me is the doping. The doping, like I have, I think I've probably been one of the only ones who have been shooting from the rooftops from day one about people doping. Yeah. And in my opinion, there's a very, very high percentage in boxing doping. Well, um, love him or hate him, Mike Tyson has always been kind of the raw truth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's obviously done quite a few things wrong yeah. inside the ring outside the yeah. ring but one thing he's always maintained is almost pretty much he's been he's been quite he's been quite truthful with stuff mm. and Eve said yeah back in the day I used to have a fake cock and I used to piss out you know of, of urine just to get by because everybody else was doing it and it was more sort of a culture that if everyone's doing it then the only way to get on equal ground is by doing what everybody else is doing yeah. and he's saying but even still today people doing it more than ever so Vada, obviously, you know, since the uh, Conor Ben situation, it seems like it's got really in the in the, in the public eye. Yeah. Most recently, Dylan White has fouled one because yeah. for the um, Anthony Joshua Dylan White White Part Two. Conor Ben, I mean, it seems like he's going back into this. I think they're appealing it. Do you, oh, do you think he was? Is it innocent or is he is he no. is he guilty? In my opinion, I think it's guilty. Um, I think anyone's caught it's guilty, no matter if it's in there accidentally or not. You're guilty. Just you're still doped, no matter what it is. You should still be banned, um, and that's the the be all and end all. I think lifetime ban should be handed out, and I think that's the only way it kind of gets things slowed down. But even at that, like there's so much ways people seem to be getting around things, and I watched something recently on uh, Victor Conte who runs Snack the the organisation which a lot of the top fighters use but it's called Hall of Shame it's on Netflix on, on the Untold series and uh, shows like how he had, he was in like a scandal of like loads of athletes Barry Bonds uh, Marion Jones and stuff back in the day mm. all doping and how they were getting away with and how so much things was like you no, know, being able to kind of nullify it when you get tested and stuff, and you're going, like, how that shit. If life is advanced and technology is advanced, so most likely they're they're on something different, and you can do something different now. I think, but they're blockers, um, don't they? Yeah, there's loads of little different things I would say. Um, but you know, I don't know. No, nobody person has ever said to me, "Do you want a dope or anything like that?" And I know why. It's because my stance on. And I, I would never do it. That's the thing, you know. I, I would probably call them out, and that's what I'd probably be afraid to say. But you know, it's very hard to to, to find out who. But I've been, I was told a lot of information recently where you're going, "Fuck me, really?" So, uh, have you ever walked into a gym, or do you know like a, a gym or or individuals where you like, yeah, they're definitely they're definitely on something? No, no. But then I was told something just recently. I'm not going. To, I'm not going to repeat it on the podcast. But it blew my mind. And I'm going, what the hell? Like, it's so dangerous to sport already. And that's the thing for me. It's not about like when a world title is all serious. It's about like you know taking someone's life possibly, seriously damaging someone possibly. And if that happens, like you, know, you got to look. If I look at from my own point of view, I have kids and a missus and a family and stuff. And if you get damaged from boxing you know who's going to look after you they got to look after you um, but if you get damaged from boxing for you PD someone using PDs come on 
her her bar is that like you know what I mean? I think I think it takes that for that to happen. Someone probably there get seriously hurt, and the other person be caught doing for things they cannot change. Hmm. I mean, look at look at people that have not been on anything like Chris mm. Eubank against uh, Nick Blackwell, and obviously Nick Blackwell, um, you know, obviously suffered major mm. major brain damage yeah. thankfully he's, he's on his feet now and he's yeah. and, he, and he's walking and talking but he's definitely not the man he used to be no i think uh with black with nick um a little bit different you know he, he obviously got the brain injury in the chris fake but was okay and was going to probably have a, a normal kind of life but ended up coming back in the spawn i think that's where it happened when he when he went back spawn which you know if you get something like that you never go back in the ring and uh i think the love for boxing probably took over there really <sighs> so sad man sad very sad yeah I've, I've spoken to him a few times over social and um, he's such a lovely guy yeah such a genuine yeah. nice guy so yeah just going back to, to the current state of boxing I mean even our friend Aaron Chalmers even though he's not a crossover mm. boxer he is a boxer uh, yeah. but obviously come back from a MMA sort yeah. of background f- um, for Floyd Mayweather yeah. and I know you guys were in the corner for yeah. that I think yeah. it was at the O2 the O2 yeah how was that? Oh, it was crazy um just to get the witness Floyd in person. And I know he was he was messed about and stuff, but I like, thought Aaron done good. Aaron done all right, I but you could tell Floyd if he turned it on <laughs> at any stage of oh, he could have done anything he wanted to, but it was brilliant and you know, fair play to Aaron. Uh his second fight and he fight Floyd Mayweather. Take some balls no matter what, like no matter if you're doing it as a like charity or celebrity or whatever it was and Still takes a lot of balls to go and do it. Like, and you, you met Floyd Mayweather. What was he like? Yeah, yeah. And I was talking to him, and he, he watched my, the fight with Wood and stuff, and was just saying, "Listen, don't worry, you'll be world champion and stuff." And really nice guy. Yeah. Um, you know, I've heard people say in the past, "Never meet your idols." No one ever met him, but you know, I thought he was a lovely guy. Uh, a really down the earth um, character, very funny, uh, especially in the build up, you know, in the in, when he's warm up in the dressing room, I had to go in and watch the band he's getting wrapped and he was like singing and talking and just laughing and joking and stuff and it was very funny, yeah. Um just on that note, I mean, is there would there ever be a possibility of you going over to his camp? No, 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 no. Not for you. No, not for me, you know, there's probably a few places to look at, but you know, I don't think that'll be you no know, suited to my kind of style. Yeah. So with someone like him fifty and oh, I mean he's mm. my he's one of my go tos when I when I go and watch boxing and yeah. I'm, I'm looking over tapes uh, or, or on YouTube. He, I love just watching his style. I think he's amazing. But why why is Floyd Mayweather still fighting today? Exhibitions must be money, <laughs> must be money, and you know he's earned. He says he's earned over a billion, hasn't he? He said so. Um, why would you still be fighting? I do not know. Unless you just spend that type of money that it's very hard to maintain that lifestyle unless you're fighting. So it must be something like that, I I assume. But who knows? You may just do it for the love of the game. Mm. The love of the game. Your 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 view on this uh, Fury against Nangano, which is going to be happening at the end of the year? Yeah, I think Fury stops him. Fury stops him. It's different, you know, like, Unless he just like wants to carry him for a few rounds, but Nugano, fantastic MMA fighter, but as a boxer, he's he's in there with probably the best, he, no, definitely the best heavyweight of our generation. Um, so come on, he's not gonna. And why do you think Fury is doing it? Money, 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 man. The this and everybody's in this game for money. The people would say like, no, I'm in it for legacy and all this bollocks. That's a load of shit, man. They're in it for money. You're only in it for money. You would it's too hard of a game to be into, to be uh just in it to you know have the crack. You know, you're you're as I say, you're putting life on the line every time you step in the ring, no matter who you face. Yeah. So on that note, if someone offered you a fight against Lopez again, and then it was a million quid, mm. or someone offered you ten million pounds to fight a former MMA fighter, which one are you going for? The MMA fighter, hundred percent, hundred percent. No, definitely. Def- Listen, I still won't be world champion. I still believe I will be world champion, but the world title itself isn't going to be like bread on your table. You know what I mean? The the ten million fucking pound will put more food in your table than having the, having the world title. So, obviously, like, the 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 money is probably one of the main 
reasons most people box I believe yeah agreed um, Joshua his last fight mm. obviously he won he stopped, he stopped yep. him knocked him out um, how did you think his performance was and where do you think he goes from there because I personally feel if he steps in the ring with a Wilder Fury he devast- he gets stopped badly um, that's just my view yep. um, as, as a fan what do you think about his performance and what do you think about him moving forward? Yeah, I thought he performed okay. He had a new coach, just loaded new things, different things. And, you know, he just went there and got the job done and, and, and knocked it out emphatically. So um, I don't think you can take that away from him. And if he does go and fade away later next, you got to give him credit because, let's be honest, that man doesn't need a box no more. He's earned the tape money where he can just sail off into the sunset can't he really I think his net worth is like 120 million or something like so he doesn't need he's earned generational wealth like and he's boxing because he still wants to prove something to himself it seems and obviously you know add add more wealth to him himself his business his company and all out there and you know do everything for his own family uh, in the future but it seems that like he's got something to prove why he's still fighting mm. because you know if like I, I think like I have criticised Josh for plenty but I think a lot of the criticism is unfair because we're not in his shoes and we don't know what's what's going on in his life or what's going on you know in his career and how, how things are moving and, you know everybody can point and say he should do this way do it that way but he's got to let him do it his own way and you know however he ends up or whatever he does you know he's he's done things that nobody else in boxing will probably ever do and mm-hmm. earn the type of money that very very few people will ever earn if he fights Wilder what's your opinion on how Wilder Wilder knocks him he's just too much of a devastating puncher and I think Josh is probably too static to kind of outbox him but who knows listen it's definitely not a foregone conclusion I think Josh would definitely could beat him but we need to have the performance of his life to do it yeah mm. and the same question about Fury I could never see him beating Fury and I've always said that from from way before when everybody was on the Joshua hype train and saying Joshua beats Fury and stuff I was never on that train I was always on the Fury train in that sense I, I, I just believe his movement his speed and everything his says for that for his movement speed for that says but everything against an opponent who is smaller than is just it'll be I think it would be an easy fight for him. Yeah. This is really my last thing I want to ask you about, uh, bro. Um is you, you mentioned earlier about investments, yep. property, condon promotions, yep. etc. You've now got your own beer. Mm. And I'm yep. surprised you haven't bought me one today. I didn't bring any over. <laughs> I didn't bring any over. I always didn't bring suitcase, but yeah, we've brought our own beer, Le Gras, Le Gras Lager, Irish Lager, brewed with Shamrocks um, for our Irish American friends, as we know, um, who will who will love that. Um, but yeah, uh, it's going well. Um, hasn't officially been launched in the UK yet. Um, been softly launched in Ireland, but mainly launched in Spain. It's it's all over kind of Spain. I think it's in Lanzarote, Tenerife, Ibiza, um, Santa Ponza, and one or two other places. So so he sort of when I saw the post of it, I mm. thought, oh, that's come out of the blue a bit. Yeah. Um, was it just a spontaneous decision, or was that always in the making for for, for you know? it's been there for a while ah, about three years about three years it's been in the making it, it hasn't been just out of the blue bang and it's it's here it's it's been about three years in the making and, you know even the lager and stuff is you know very very highly rated um i'm not a big lager drinker myself but it actually is nice so yeah um it's been a bit of time a bit of planning and now the trigger has been pulled and and, and it's been let off the leash yeah so um it's a lager. Are you going into IPAs and that kind of stuff? Well, a lot of people who drink it think it's very much like an IPA. Okay. Um, it's not though. It is a lager, but uh, it's not like mild pasteurized or mild, like filtered and stuff. It's just like a lot of natural ingredients in a small brewery as well. So everything is kind of done correctly. 
And what, what what's the game plan with that? Is it to scale it and then sell it on, or or is there a plan? Yeah, I think so. To make it big enough, get it to America. I think. Who knows? I, I have no kind of end goal yet on it. You know, just ride the wave and see how see how far we go. And you know, I think if it lands, if we can get it in the America, it lands well in New York and stuff. It's game over, isn't it? Really, and and you just. It's a, a complete takeover, I think. It's a smart move because obviously there's always been a culture with the the Irish with yeah. with, with with having a drink and getting together with friends and family, and there's yeah. always that feel good feeling. But also you, your old friend, Mister Conor McGregor, yeah. with proper whiskey, and also is it Forge Stout? Yes, yes. Um, which is almost like his version of a Guinness. Yeah. Is um, he, he seems like he's doing very well there. Was that yeah. was that bit of a I don't know, a bit of inspiration, two Irish guys, two fighters, two legends, you know, going going out there, building their own their own brand. And yeah, definitely, you see what, what, what Connor has done and it's been unbelievable, you know. Anywhere you go, I think people are trying to get the whiskey and it's just sold it everywhere. And he, he's just an unbelievable promoter, isn't he, for, for, for his drink? Like, jo- like trying to make Joshua drink when he's, he did, in, the, yeah. when he's in the ring. He's, he's fucking crazy, but... Uh, yeah, definitely. I think it. I think is a very good inspiration for 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 the move. Yeah, you were still in contact with Conor McGregor. The old team. The old team. Just yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he um. Yeah. He just seems like he's flying. Yeah. He's nice. No, doing really well. And and it's like if you follow him on social media, you just you get a laugh. He just he does some mad stuff all the time. Okay, so bar getting your new coach, getting yeah. your new team, etc. What else is in the pipeline for you, bro? I know you've obviously got, you've got your family, your businesses, obviously boxing. Anything else that we could look forward to? Nah, nothing in particular. Just you know, keeping an out. You know, I have a, I have a coach soon. I have a fight probably lined up for the end of the year, and we'll see how we move forward. Good man. My question that I always ask the guests yeah. is what I asked you last time which is be happy never content i've got yeah. my own version of it mick on what does be happy never content mean to you for a second time always chase my goal and not stand the same place good man thank you very much mate i really appreciate good your mind. time it's been a very very good podcast and um be happy never content i'm look, looking forward for, to you becoming world champion cheers steve Top, to top man guys before we end this episode i have to give one more mention to this week's sponsors i secure vehicles now i've already mentioned their products they are the very best in what they do they have a wide range of different services and different systems to protect your asset and your vehicle head over to their website to find out a bit more Thanks for watching this week's episode. There's going to be some more exciting guests, some big names, and some really, really juicy episodes.